this medical crew is flying across the beautiful state of Oklahoma on their way to help save the life of somebody involved in a serious car accident when about three minutes into the flight, the flight paramedic seated in the back hears a muffled thud from the engine. The pilot tells the crew that they have lost power and that they will be entering an auto rotation to emergency land the aircraft. The helicopter rapidly descends as they try to avoid power lines and fences when the helicopter crashes into the ground tail first, destroying the aircraft and causing serious injuries to all on board. How is it that this nearly new helicopter could lose power? Even though it was a beautiful day out, how could weather have played a role in this accident? Coming up on this episode of The Doctor Medic. Before we get started, in, in full disclosure, I personally know several of the medical crew members of this flight, and I even flew as a flight paramedic for this company and even worked several shifts at this very base. This tail number in this video is 334 AM, and the aircraft that I flew on full time was tail number N335 AM. The date of this accident was January the 2nd, 2013, and took place in Seminole, Oklahoma, which is just about 30 minutes east of Oklahoma City. This aircraft was owned and operated by Air Methods Corporation with the local brand name of Metaflight. The base for this aircraft was located at Seminole Regional Airport where the crew had living quarters near some of the hangars and a helipad just outside of their living quarters. With many helicopter EMS bases around the world, their helipad and their hangar are oftentimes located right next to each other. So when the aircraft needs to undergo maintenance or needs to be removed from the elements such as hail or tornadoes or snow, they would simply move the aircraft inside their hangar by pushing the aircraft on some sort of dolly system. But at this base, the hangar and the helipad were actually not connected and in order to get the aircraft inside of a hangar, a pilot would actually have to fly the aircraft to another location at the airport and then put the aircraft inside. This is going to be an important thing to note as this story moves along. They are flying in an awesome Eurocopter, which is now owned by Airbus, model EC-130B4 that was manufactured in 2009 and was powered by a Turbomeca Aerial 2B1 turbine engine making 747 horsepower. The total time on this aircraft was just 1,100 hours. The pilot was a very experienced 58-year-old male with a commercial pilot's license with ratings for airplane, single-engine land, helicopter, and instrument helicopter. He had a second-class medical certificate with the only limitation being that he must wear corrective lenses. This pilot had a total of 9,708 hours of total flight time with almost 700 hours of time in this type of aircraft. They departed the Seminole Airport at 12.42 hours on a Part 91 positioning flight towards Okima, Oklahoma to pick up a patient who had been involved in a serious rollover vehicle collision and then fly that patient to a trauma center in the city for further care and treatment. But about three minutes into the flight, the flight paramedic hears a thud from the engine area and the pilot heard a sound like something had struck the helicopter. The pilot immediately began measures to enter an auto rotation to land the aircraft. I have discussed auto rotation in previous videos, but in short, this is a maneuver that all helicopter pilots must become proficient in in order to land a helicopter that has lost power to the main rotors, such as when an engine shuts off. This process essentially is using gravity and the speed of upward air while descending to keep the main rotor blades spinning, while at the same time rapidly descending and then pulling collective or full power just before the ground in order to flare the aircraft and soften the landing. While they were descending, several of the medical crew called out obstacles that they could see, such as power lines, while the pilot located an open field to land the aircraft. Everything was kind of looking really promising at this point, up until someone called out that there was a barbed wire fence in their pathway. The pilot stated that he was going to try and get over that fence and was forced to pull hard aft on the cyclic, which pitched the nose of the aircraft towards the sky. As they cleared the fence, the tail boom struck the ground first, which essentially kind of catapulted the front of the cabin of the aircraft hard down on the ground. 
This caused many of the seats to break away, as they are tended to do, to soften a hard impact such as this. The Fenestron tail of the aircraft became separated and came to rest about 30 feet from the main wreckage, while the crew compartment rotated a full 180 degrees after hitting the ground and came to rest upright. This EC-130 is an amazing aircraft and is really comfortable for many crew members in the HEMS world as it provides very good access to the full length of the patient. In contrast to most helicopters, the pilot in the EC-130 actually sits on the left side of the aircraft. This aircraft is normally set up to have two seats in the back, one for the flight paramedic and one for the flight nurse, and then a sled system to hold the patient. Occasionally, if weight permits, they could install a third seat in the back, which allows for the transport of a family member if the patient is a child or a baby, and also allows for the participation of a third medical crew member who may be flying along as like a third rider due to being on orientation, and this is exactly what happened on this day. There was a second flight nurse on this call who had just been hired by Metaflight and was completing his third rider calls when this accident occurred. In this case, the pilot was seated in the front left of the cockpit, the flight nurse was seated in the left rear seat, the flight paramedic was in the right rear seat, and the third rider flight nurse was seated in between them. The flight paramedic stated that as they crashed, he could remember looking forward through the big windshield of the EC-130 and seeing the front windshield shatter and then a rush of cold liquid rushing over him and the smell of jet fuel. A little bit of a side note here, this pilot did an absolute amazing job of getting this aircraft on the ground. This was a fully loaded aircraft that had an extra crew member, was almost at its maximum weight, and they were only flying a few hundred feet above the ground when they lost power, and he still managed to get the aircraft on the ground. But even with great flying, the fuel tank ruptured and splashed dozens, if not hundreds of gallons of jet fuel all over the cabin and crew members. What is the difference between the outcome of this accident and many others just like it? A spark. All it would have taken was a single spark and the outcome would have been drastically different. This EC-130 at the time was not outfitted with what is known as a CRFT or crash resistant fuel tank. These crash resistant fuel tanks are made of a composite material and have the ability to kind of self seal in several areas in case of certain ruptures, punctures or tears drastically reducing the likelihood of a post-impact fire, which is a massive concern with helicopters when they crash. Following quite a long streak of fatal helicopter crashes where deaths have occurred specifically due to the post-impact fires, and especially on Airbus helicopters like the EC-130, A-STAR 350, H-125, the NTSB published a safety recommendation report in 2015 that cited several previous accidents stating, Neither the A-STAR 350 nor the EC-130 were equipped with a crash-resistant fuel system, which, if installed, may have prevented or reduced the risk of thermal injuries. The NTSB noted that since Airbus has since designed crash-resistant tanks into their new models as of 2012, that they should prioritize making those crash-resistant tanks available to retrofit older aircraft, including that the availability of an approved retrofit kit to install a crash-resistant fuel system into existing A-Star 350s and 130s would assist owners and operators in mitigating the demonstrated safety risk of post-crash fires in survivable accidents. It is worth noting that since the time of the NTSB recommendations, Air Methods has retrofitted all of their A-STAR 350 H125-EC-130 aircraft with these tanks. Likewise, Global Medical Response, which owns and operates MedTrans, Eagle Med, and Arivac Life Team, among others, has also retrofitted their entire fleet with crash-resistant fuel tanks. But anyway, back to the paramedic right after the crash. When he opened his eyes, he did not see or hear anything. No people, no aircraft, not a thing. Only the warning alarms from the instrument panel could be heard. He was then able to unbuckle himself and step out of the aircraft onto the ground. As he looked back into the aircraft, the new flight nurse was reaching towards him, telling him to pull him out, which is exactly what the paramedic had to do. 
He pulled the nurse nearly 30 yards away from the aircraft and onto dry ground where he couldn't feel or smell any more jet fuel. He then was able to make some phone calls. Remember that they were in an open field in very rural Oklahoma, so there was no way that they could be sure that anyone even noticed that they had crashed. He called his wife, as I would, to tell her that they had crashed, and then he called AIRCOM, the Dispatch Center for Air Methods, and did his best to relay GPS coordinates from the severely injured pilot to the dispatcher while simultaneously trying to get the doors open for the pilot and the other flight nurse on the left side of the aircraft. At this point, the paramedic said that he stopped and did a self-assessment to check on his very own injuries. He noticed that he was short of breath, that his chest hurt, and that he had severe, severe back pain. His focus was then directed back at the nurse and pilot, and he said that he was thinking, well, that there was so much jet fuel on and around us that it could ignite at any moment, and I just wanted to get them out. Soon after, a bystander finally noticed them, and not long after that, rescuers arrived. All four of these crew members were then transported by neighboring helicopter flight services to a local trauma center. All four of them survived, with all four of them suffering severe injuries, which included fractured femurs, fractured backs, and with one suffering from permanent paralysis. So what caused this accident? Well, in the operator's manual for the EC-130, Eurocopter has a section listed specifically for additional operations to be performed before flight in cold or extreme cold weather. One of these additional operations that are to be performed is to remove accumulations of snow or ice from the whole of the helicopter, particularly from the forward cowling air intakes. In terms of the engine, this means that the pilot or the mechanic needs to physically check and remove any snow or ice accumulation on its forward cowling air intake. Later, in the same manual it states, manually and visually check for snow and ice inside the air intake duct up to the first stage of the compressor. This means that the pilot or mechanic would physically have to step up onto the aircraft where the intake filter is and lift this cowling up and visually inspect to see if there is any ice or snow. The manual states that these are not recommendations, they are requirements. Likewise, the operator, in this case air methods, also had their own FAA-approved pre-flight checklist, which was actually found in the wreckage. On station two of this checklist, it states to check the engine air intake area and clear it of any snow, ice, or foreign objects. Also, in an information notice from Eurocopter in 2011, they stated to take the following precautions when parking the aircraft out in the open. After arriving on a parking area in cold weather and falling snow or rain, it is recommended to install the air intake blank rapidly following engine shutdown. Then, for pre-flight during the next flight, they state, the quick installation of the blanks is a basic precaution. But their use does not guarantee that no ice will accumulate in the air intake, which is a possible phenomenon of water seepage in the air intake due to rain or molten snow. Consequently, if the helicopter has been parked in the open in cold weather or falling snow or rain, and whether it is equipped with specific engine air intake snow protection or not, like snow filter or sand filter or intake, multi-purpose intakes, the following steps must be taken. They must be taken. Remove snow and ice from around the intakes, especially from the air intakes. Remove the engine air intake blank, then remove any snow and ice that may have accumulated on the air intake and the air intake screen or the filter system. And finally, there was even a supplement that was published that stated that during the first flight of the day or the first flight following snow or freezing rain, that the engine cowling should be manually inspected and to verify air intake to be free of snow, ice, or water, particularly under the filter. Well, prior to the accident flight on January 2nd, the last flight that this aircraft had was nearly three days prior on December 30th, where it flew that day for a bit over an hour with no discrepancies noted, and then landed on the helipad right outside the base living quarters. The helicopter did not fly the next day on December 31st, although a daily inspection was completed. On January 1st, the helicopter also did not fly and remained sitting outside on the helipad, but for some reason, a daily inspection was not completed. 
Now, during these three days that the helicopter stayed outside without flying, the weather hovered right around freezing at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius with mist, fog, freezing rain, and drizzle. So what about those pre-flight checks? To recap, if snow or freezing rain is possible and the aircraft has to be parked outside, the pilot or mechanic are to install the intake duct plug immediately after engine shutdown. Then during their pre-flight, the pilot should remove the plug while also inspecting the cowling for snow and ice, and more importantly, lifting the engine intake cowling and doing a thorough inspection underneath the filter for any snow or ice accumulation. But none of that took place. The aircraft sat outside in freezing rain and drizzle for nearly three days with the plug not getting installed until two days in for some reason. And then when they caught this flight around noon on January 2nd, no one inspected underneath the filter element inside the engine cowling for snow or ice. The engine was actually taken off site for in-depth testing and they found that the engine examination revealed that the four axial compressor blades exhibited significant deformation on the outboard tips of their leading edges in the direction opposite of normal rotation, which is consistent with the ingestion of soft body foreign object debris such as ice. Finally, based on the weather conditions that the helicopter was exposed to during the three days before the accident, it is likely that ice formed in the engine air inlet before the flight and that when the pilot increased the engine power during takeoff, the accumulated ice separated from the inlet and was ingested by the engine and damaged the compressor blades. Investigators determined that the probable cause of this accident to be the loss of engine power due to ice ingestion, but contributing to the accident was maintenance personnel's delayed decision to install the helicopter's engine inlet cover until after the engine had already been exposed to moisture and freezing temperatures and their inadequate daily pre-flight airworthiness checks, which did not detect the ice formation. Following this crash, Air Methods, Eurocopter, the FAA, and even Turbomeca, the engine manufacturer, all publish safety bulletins with reminders to install the engine air intake cover as soon as possible following an engine shutdown and to thoroughly check the air intake, especially under the filter for accumulation of snow or ice. But even with this crash and the reminder safety bulletins from Eurocopter, from the FAA, from Turbomeca, and even this crash being all over the news, just five weeks later, and just a few miles down the road from this crash, another crash happened in Oklahoma City, but this time with two fatalities because of the exact same reason. More on that in a future video though. In this Metaflight crash, the engine stopped working because of ice and snow that shouldn't have been there in the first place because it should have been inspected by the pilot and the mechanic. But I absolutely commend this pilot for his amazing ability to get this aircraft on the ground with no fatalities. I commend the flight paramedic who we later come to find out that he had severe injuries of his own and even a broken back, was able to pull one of the flight nurses out of the aircraft into safety, was able to relay GPS coordinates to his dispatch and ease the pain of the other flight nurse who was trapped in the aircraft. I commend air methods and even other flight services such as Medtrans for taking steps after this crash to retrofit their aircraft with crash resistant fuel tanks. I hope you learned something from this video. I hope it makes a difference in the future, even if it means that just one of you goes the extra step to double check your checklist and to do what is required to maintain safety. I do hope that everyone stays safe out there. Do take care of yourselves and I hope everyone has a beautiful rest of your day.